G'day and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast, the show where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from all around the world. To become a better Spiro, come and join our spearfishing community at noobspiro.com. In today's show, we're speaking with West Australian-based Spiro, Louis Van Senden, and Louis going to speak to us all about hunting mulloway, or is it otherwise known as jewfish. So he's going to tell us all about the conditions that you need to find these fish, um, what it's like hunting in the swash zone, the gear that you need to hunt these fish, and he also shares with us a great story um, in his scariest moments, so stay tuned for that. Enjoy the show. Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. Adreno is one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores. You can visit Adreno online at spearfishing.com.au or in store at their Brisbane or Sydney locations. I wanted to share awesome experiences that you can have when you are in the water and that's why I started spearfishing. Don't overcomplicate your gear, don't go dotting dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> it's a whole new world and it's mysterious, it's magical. Beats the shit out of knitting anyway. Oh yeah. G'day, Noob Spiro listeners. Today we're in interviewing a uh, quite a well-known spearfishing writer. I guess you could say Louis Van Senden has been writing articles for a long time. He's published articles in Spearfishing Down Under magazine, IFSN, Fish Life magazine and more. He's also co-founded Dry Store where they sell equipment like, uh, I guess, outdoor waterproof bags is their specialty. Is that what you'd say, Louis? Yep, just, yeah. And we felt, sell... Um Fish cooler bags as well for keeping your fish cool on the boat. Oh, cool. All right, and he's also spent considerable time, uh, oh, nine months out abalone diving, and he's got quite a, a bit of a background in graphic design and spent a long time around spearfishing. You're also our first guest from Western Australia. Is that Brilliant. right? So it, Representing the West. <laughs> represent <laughs> West Side. So, yeah, so welcome to the show, Louis. All right, man, we always start here, but why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about how you got started spearfishing? Well, I guess I, um, as a youngster, was right into my surfing and spent a lot of time in and around the water and uh, I guess it, it evolved from flat spells where there was no surf and getting in there with mask and snorkel and kind of as time went by, I guess I was spending more time diving than surfing and yeah, I was just uh, evolved from there and I guess moved up from a hand spear th- with my mates to, to buying my first gun and that kind of thing and I guess the... Uh, the big catalyst for me was meeting an, another Spiro and being able to have a buddy to go with. And from there, I just, yeah, I grew up in spearing around Sydney and um, oh, should I keep going or should I? No, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, so who, who was the first buddy you sort of met? Who, what, was, what was his name and how, how did that relationship sort of progress? Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I was actually just in the water. It was quite unusual and when I was probably 13 or 14, I met a guy called Jack and he was um, about, about as keen as I was on spearing. So we, we, we kept seeing each other down at the water and, and eventually started going together. And it, it, so it was a really good kind of competitive, you know, friendship growing up and, and seeing what fish we could land together and what we could find. And it, yeah, it was good fun. Cool. Yeah, man. What about, uh, what about some obstacles when you're starting out and you're trying to get those first good fish? What sort of held you back or, or challenged you? Uh, I, rem- I, I remember my first, the first kingfish encounter I had and I'd swum out with like a, uh, an undersea woody and I was, you know, in about 10 metres of water and I had these 10 kilo kingfish swim up to the end of my spear gun and I just, you know, I, I, I pulled the trigger and I just saw the spear flop down to the bottom of the ocean and <laughs> the, the fish swam away and I kind of realised pretty early on that those, you know, that European style guns, not to be derogatory to the old woody, but it wasn't quite the uh, weapon of choice for those kind of fish. Um, so, yeah, moving to a rail gun, a European style rail gun, oh, South African, I guess, I had, had a rabbi tech back in the early oh, days. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. um yeah, that was a, a pretty big step. The, the difference between that and the old the old stainless steel shaft with the screw on flopper oh. was uh, yeah, yeah, a big change. And you mentioned um, before starting in Sydney, uh, what sort of ground were you doing there? Was it mostly shore diving? Yeah, I don't think I I don't think I dove out of a boat until I was yeah I'd probably been diving for two or three years before I dove out of a boat. I mean, in, growing up in Sydney, you, you have amazing access to you know deep water right on the shore and 
there's not that much need for a boat unless you want to go out to some of the deeper reefs. Um, but most of the fish you target, you can target off the shore. You know, we were catching lots of kingies and seeing snapper and, um, you know, most of the, the target species around there are accessible from the shore. So, yeah, it was it was really nice place to grow up diving because you had, you know, 20 metres of pretty regularly and, and yeah, in between the in between the lulls, there was in between the diving, there was good surf, so it was good. So you balanced out surfing with spearfishing quite happily. You met a buddy called Jack, and you started a nice competitive friendship there in Sydney. You learned early lessons about spear guns and moved on to a South African rail gun. Sounds pretty typical of some Australian spearos. Um, but um, what's sort of like a memorable fish story you might have from sort of your early days? Um, I guess a pretty funny one. We um, we got excited about fads, thinking that, you know, fads work out in, in 50, 100 metres of water. I'm sure they'll work near the coast to get us kingies. So we, um, <laughs> my dad is a scientist and he had some um, old subsurface boys hanging around at home and we um, jimmied up a little fad to ha- take out in, in uh, about 10 metres of water out of the front of our place. Yeah. And um, we, so we were at this dive spot one day and I, we'd put it out there and never really seen anything around it, but it, it just we tied it off to the bottom pretty well with some pretty solid rope. And one day I got there and, and there was a snapper just sitting on it. And I was thinking, like, what the, what on earth's going on here? Like, it's <laughs> like you know, it was not, well, not a big one, like maybe a kilo snapper, but it was just sitting right on the rope. And I swam closer and lined it up, lined it up, pulled the trigger, started pulling it up. And as I'm trying to pull it up, I noticed that there was a hook coming out of its mouth and a fisherman had caught it and then the fish had gotten wrapped around our fad and we and it must have snapped his line. So then I... I just took my snapper home. And I was pretty chuffed. <laughs> yeah, it's pull, awesome. pull the hook out. You never would have told anyone about that. <laughs> oh, that's that was, good. You know, so that yeah. sticks out for you. Did you ever actually get any other fish, legitimate fish on that pad? <laughs> <laughs> I, I only ever shot one other snapper there. Um, oh, that's we, pretty good. We used to get plenty of kingies and uh, I used to target ludric and brim and whiting in the shallows. That was pretty enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so your, 10 yeah. Meter, your 10 metre fad was actually a winner on oh, Kings. Yeah. <laughs> Go. We, we um, yeah, we know we, we did actually have, you know, Benito and Kingies sometimes swimming near it, but I mean, they're probably there anyway, but <laughs> I'll claim them. <laughs> nah, yeah, claim it. It was a very effective. Well, your dad's a game. scientist. Surely he knows something, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we used to get. Well, the one memorable fish actually Jack got was the big fish. So I was a bit devo about that, but he um, he shot about a. I think it was about 25 kilo cobia just off the shore there. Oh wow! So found it, found it asleep on the bottom. So oh. yeah, well, the, and that's as like like a 13, 14 year old noob. Oh, he would have been 15, 16 by that stage. Oh, so, that's still yeah. a bloody good fish. Yeah. Right? Oh, it was a, yeah, it was a monster. There was some certainly some envy. <laughs> I bet you there was. I'd be jealous too. I still haven't shot a good cobia yet. No, I, I come close. Last time we were out, me we. Too. we I got in the water and I just had my 1.2 Rob Allen and loaded it up and the um, the bridle snapped, you know, the Dyneema snapped on it and I just had a single rub and I thought, bugger it, I'll dive down and lo and behold, what did we estimate that fish to be at? That was big over coat? 20 kilo, yeah. What's that? Over 20 kilo, Oh, yeah. 20, 30. Yeah. It, was, it was a big fish, man. It gets bigger as the days go by. It's probably more like 45. It haunts oh, yeah. me at night. You said 40 originally. <laughs> yeah, that's a bloody it was a big fish. It was a big we we reined it, it in, but fish. yeah, single rubber, just, you know, this, uh, you just see this sort of spear just sort of dropping away, and I'm sort of glad I didn't even hit the thing, you know. It would have been pretty upsetting to injure that big old fish, but yeah, yeah. and it, I'm guessing it wouldn't have tasted real good at sort of that size. Oh, but. I think. No, I think they're pretty good still. They still yeah. taste pretty good at the size, yeah. So a nice segue from memorable fish story would be hunting technique. What's your favourite spearfishing hunting technique, Louis, and how do you apply it effectively? I kind of I kind of see that there's a, there's a couple of pretty prominent styles of hunting uh, that, you know, different people employ at different times. But, you know, for me there's the two types of typical spearers that some of them are s- swimmers and they do a lot of swimming and then they shoot, tend to shoot fish from above. And then there's there's a more kind of, um, you know, the waiters that are, you go to a good spot and you do a lot of, you're consistently diving and waiting on the bottom for a fish to come to you rather than trying to swim a long distance and try and find it. Yep. Um, and I'd, I'd say I'm more of a waiter. I, I tend to like swim for a while, find find a patch of reef that I like, and then I'll just keep diving on it and 
you know, if there's bait there and there's it's looking good and it feels fishy, then it's often better to wait at that spot and keep diving on it until you find a fish rather than to do a lot of yards and, and you know, maybe happen upon another good spot. But I guess it's... Um, it's yeah, horses for courses. So mm. you, you know, some you know, you, if you're diving shallows and there's not a lot of bait around, you you just kind of swim a lot and see what you can find. Yeah, but mm. yeah, just depends on what you're targeting as well. Like if I'm targeting, um, like if I was targeting snapper and things like that, then yeah, I'd definitely be trying to. I like to um, try and keep my my whole body in a shadow if I can. Like if you can get into a cave or if you can get you know, out of the sight so they can't see your size and whatnot, then I find they tend to get a little more confident in coming right in and, and offering a shot. So, yeah, that's, okay. the, that's my and, tip. And combining, like, with that minimising your profile and getting behind something, do you use noise with snapper and things like that? Yeah. Um, on the – on the, I, I kind of find it different on the east and the west coast. So, um, like, the snapper I've shot on the east coast – have been pretty responsive to noise, but the snapper I've shot on the west coast have generally been pretty dumb. So I don't know ah, as much. I'm coming the west coast. <laughs> yeah. uh, pretty cagey over here, very hard fish to get onto. But all right, so two types of sparrows, swimmers and waders. And um, so you find your consistent sort of, or your nice bit of reef, and then you're just sort of consistently diving and investigating that area and finding like a good rest or something where, where you think yeah. like predatory fish yeah. might be coming in. Yeah, cool. that's kind of the go, yeah. Love oh, it. Yeah. All right, Louis. What about uh, what about the scariest moment you've had out on the water, mate? Have you had any near misses that you could share with us? Yeah, I. Uh, I've got. Have a, I've, I guess all of us have had a couple, but um, there's certainly one that stands out for me. That happened last year. Uh, my wife and I, Ebony, she's a, she's a keen diver, and we went up to Warra Station, which is up north northwestern Australia, so it's just kind of south of Exmouth. Um, and we were diving there out of a tinny. And it, generally, you get a pretty big swell up there in winter, but it's you get clear water and there's a lot of ground inside the reef. So you've got a big boundary reef that kind of blocks the swell and you can still hunt inside there when there's big swell. And we headed out one day. We're just kind of swimming along the inside of the reef where, the you know, as the wash comes over, I guess the fish, a lot of the little emperors and stuff hang out in there and, and we, were, we were kind of chasing those little, I think they're called a... Um, blue lined emperor or some there's some little emperor that lives in there okay. and they're really tasty so we were, we were swimming along the inside of this reef edge and i found this crack that kind of went out to sea and it looked like a primo little spot for a fish to like hide out in i thought oh yeah perfect i'll swim down in there and see what i can see and my wife ebony she was swimming with the camera and she followed me in there and sure enough i got down there there's a big school of spangled emperor and i, I shot one and I, as I was coming up, I noticed there was a fair bit of wash in there and we, I got to the surface and the water just started ripping out to sea. So our boat was parked on the inside of the reef oh, wow. and, and we were just getting sucked out to sea like at, you know, a rate of knots that, I, you know, we were swimming as hard as we could and we couldn't, couldn't get any ground against it. And so Whew. by that stage, I, we were both packing it and I was trying to keep Ebony calm going, you know, we've just got to just got to chill out and relax in this situation and and swimming and swimming and swimming as hard as we can and so um i i grabbed the camera off her because it's pretty big and heavy and so she, i kind of tried to push her ahead a bit so she'd get ahead and we kind of got sucked out the side of where these like it was probably six to eight foot waves breaking oh. right next to us and i was just like i was, I was having nightmares because it's you know <laughs> the, the reef edge is about probably 10 k's long and there's oh. a passage passage about four four k's up from where we were getting sucked out Ugh. so you know I, I in my head i was going oh four k swim against a current you know it was just yeah anyway so we i think the um the reason the water had been gushing out was because a big set had obviously pushed all the water on top of the reef yeah. and so after about you know a minute and a half of just legging it against it, it started to ease a little bit and so ebony managed to get back to the back inside and up the boat and i kind of crawled my way along the reef holding onto reef and managed to get against it and we both got back to the tinny and just lay down there and just like, oh that was massive yeah <laughs> wow so like so, worst case scenario you would have been swept out to the out edge of the reef and was it was it did you have a boat person back in the boat no no nah, nah, we were just anchored up so <laughs> it would have been and and you know like we up there it's just so remote that you're really on your own 
and you so yeah and and it's always you know, it runs through my mind that it was kind of me leading her in there and her mum would have killed me. <laughs> that, that one sounds hard to predict, though. Like you said, like, I've, uh, like I haven't done a lot of kind of diving like that where you've, you're have you in like a tidal kind of enclosed reef and then you've got big sets pushing in, yeah. filling it up, like flooding it, like you say, and then all of a sudden the set dies off and that, that all that water's got to rush back out through a narrow gap. I'd, yeah. I'd imagine that. That's kind of like a behaviour that might be quite common to those sorts of systems, but I haven't come across it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, because I dove that exact kind of area for the, last, the, the few days before it and I'd seen, I'd seen water going out there but not, you know, not like that. Like it was, yeah, yeah right. it's, it was a bit of an anomaly, I guess. But So yeah. takeaways for you? What, what, what? Uh, yeah, definitely be more cautious when you're diving along. When you think you're, if there's big swell out to sea and you know it's a dangerous day, just be a lot more cautious about diving inside reefs. Even though you think it looks perfectly calm and protected and flat, you know, there's always going to be that risk. That, so you've just got to be more cautious. And, mm. Yeah. Guys, if you're after more podcast action, go and check out our mate Jason Selms over at australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. He talks all things hunting, shooting, and fishing. It's a great listen. He's getting plenty of downloads. He's big in Canada, South Africa, even Japan. It's fantastic. Jason talks to experts in the field on all things shooting, hunting, and fishing. It's a really, really good listen, so go and check him out, australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. The Australian Hunting Podcast is the only hunting, shooting and fishing podcast radio show in Australia. With over 40,000 downloads per month, you are sure to find some information that can help you. If you love hunting, shooting, fishing and a little bit of politics, the Australian Hunting Podcast has you covered. To listen, check us out on iTunes and visit australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. All right, we're into the uh, next section of the show. It's called Veterans Vault. Pirate Pete, where are you? It's time to open the Veterans Vault. All right, so the Veterans Vault uh, is a segment on the show where we get our guests to dive deep into their area of knowledge or expertise. And uh, today, Louis is going to speak to us all about hunting and finding Jewfish, or uh, as they're otherwise known as, politically correctly, the Mulloway. So, um, yeah, take it away, Louis. All righty. So, I guess, uh, like many Spiros, I've obsessed about Mulloway for a lot of years. And, uh, you know, finding them, for me, the biggest part of of chasing Mulloway is finding them because they're such an elusive fish. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think they're... A beautiful fish that need to be very cautiously hunted because they are vulnerable because they do love the shallow water. So, so like when I when I hear Mulloway, I straight away think of that big awesome diamonds in the lateral line, like so distinctive. And when you come across the school in the shallows, that they're, they're, they're just awesome, eh? Yeah, they are. They're such a beautiful fish, you know. That and some of the places you find them, it's just yeah, you, you'd never expect to to see them in such shallow water. So that's one of the biggest things I think that people will often overlook is just ridiculously shallow spots. You know, I've I've had them in knee deep water where you've got you know ten oh, yeah. kilo fish just right up in there. So it's it's you've got to be really getting right in the wash, getting as 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 shallow as you can to see what you can see. Yeah, I, I read your article on. Um, drystore.com.au like it's it's a, I think it, what's it called five five tips on how to hunt and find Mulloway um, and one of the things that I sort of remember when I come across them I was in the shallows as well and one of your points was like quite often the school will be behind the wash and so yep. that that could be pretty scary for an, for an amateur because they're, they're probably thinking they're going to be heading out into you know five or six or more meters of water but what what sort of depths have you typically found them at yeah look I think um You'll often find them in three to five meters of water. Um, that's the kind of, I, I mean, three to five, and then that's the that's the shallows where you find them. You don't mm, yeah. out, out in the depth. It's a different story. I mean, if you find a spot out deep where they're regularly going to be, then you know it's generally quite a deep spot okay. that I found. You know, t- twenty meter spots that that you'll find them regularly in the deep. Okay. But um, yeah, so it's either they're kind of between the between the two areas. They're either hold up right in the shallows or they're out deep in 20 meters so cool 
All right, so what, what's their sort of behaviour like seasonally? They obviously have a migration and, and they they predate upon some sort of inshore species, I take it? Yeah, I, it's kind of an interesting one because, you know, when, when I was living in Coffs Harbour for – I lived there for probably four years um, – and I spent a lot of time just filming them in sanctuary zones just to kind of get a sense of what they do. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting because there was a, this common common held view that you get them in the winter in Coffs Harbour and not in the summer. But was it, what was that? Just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, that was Turbo's ass, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Letting loose. Yeah. That was his chair. Um, He's just... Monitoring some sound stuff. Sorry yeah, about that. Sorry, mate. I'm all yeah. over it. Yeah, over it. <laughs> so, sorry, um, you're saying there's a commonly held belief that you, you yep. know you get them in winter and not summer. Yeah, but but from you know my experiences, you know a lot of guys aren't diving the shallows in summer because you get dirtier water, um, and so that obviously makes it harder to find them. But from my experiences, every time I'd go out there in the summer, I'd still see them. You know, there's a school of fish that I'd go and film. There was you know some. 30 kilo fish in there there was probably about 20 fish regularly and i'd you know i'd, I'd go and dive on there most afternoons and i'd see them 90 percent of the time so they they really didn't move a lot and they didn't go anywhere but i mean they were in a primo spot where they had lots of tailors swimming around on top of them and so they had plenty of food and, and a good shelter and they're in a sanctuary zone so there's not really much need for them to go anywhere but um yeah it was kind of interesting to see that they didn't seem to move out in the summer like is is always taught but maybe that was just that spot but yeah that was my experience so i mean obviously fish behavior between a marine sanctuary and sort of the open water can be quite different because they they get used to i think dealing with spiros don't do do you do you think uh yeah i think um if you have a dewy hole and you go there all the time, it's not going to be a dewy hole for much longer. If you're going there all the time <laughs> and shooting at fish, it's like, you know, they, they definitely will move on yep. from a spot. They wise, they wise up a little bit is what you're saying if, they, if they're regularly sort of hit by spiros. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you're hunting them, what's your sort of typical pl- plan of attack if you're hitting out for a day and you're targeting dewfish? Yeah, I, um, the challenge with dewfish is always finding them for me, like, Okay. The actual spearing of them is a matter of just getting yourself on the bottom in the in the wash and waiting for them to kind of appear in the you know they're kind of going up and back on their gutters, so they'll be if if they're in a pretty sedentary kind of mood they'll be going up and back at their gutter just cru- cruising so just getting yourself on the bottom and they will kind of swim past you or swim up to you as they come past the gutter e- entrance or exit. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, once once you've I, I like. I'd really suggest anyone that is interested going in diving in the sanctuaries to see them, just because you know, getting a sense of their movements, you, you get a real good feel about how to hunt them. Be, sounds a bit creepy, I guess, but no, nah, no, nah, that <laughs> sort of makes sense. About, like, but, I, yeah. I like I, I can sort of relate that to a number of species. Like, like I think f- the first thing when you're hunting any fish is like you've got to be able to see them, and yeah. once you kind of identify them, then you start to start observing them and watching their behaviour. And then, like, the third step is kind of, like, adapting your body language and technique to sort of get some sort of approach on that fish. And yep. so, like, jewfish are kind of, like you say, like, finding them is the hard part. So if you go to a sanctuary, you're going to have an opportunity to observe them, and then you can kind of have an yeah. opportunity about how you're going to work an approach on them, I guess. So it makes yeah. sense. Get, yeah. a, get a good sense of what kind of structure they like, what kind of, you know, reef they're going to sit on. And, mm-hmm. yeah, so I think um, if... Yeah, as long as you I, – I like to be pretty conservative about hunting them. You know, I, I try to target the smaller fish around seven, eight kilos just because I think they taste better and, and I, I, you know, for my needs, I don't need a lot of fish. Yep. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you have a few holes that you can go to without hammering them all the time and then it's, yeah, it's a good sustainable way to, you know, get a feed. What's your, what's your personal best Jew fish? Uh, I shot one about 20 kilos. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and that was out of a out of a school of you know a bunch of really big ones. They, so get, was, they get parasites, yeah. So like uh, oh, hey, hey. they get worms. They worms. get worms. I think I don't know if worms are parasites, or, but yeah, the worms. You get the worms in the flesh, but I don't think they're a major drama when you're eating them. They don't. You don't. I don't think they affect the flesh in dewies. I, I know that with um, you know with kingies and sambos and stuff, especially over here with sambos. 
I, I was getting into eating the, the smaller sambos here and then I had one that had eggs of worms in it and it was just the, the flesh went to rubbish when you start, when you cooked it. So, mm, mm. Um, yeah, but with Mulloway, I, you know, that big one had, had worms in it and it wasn't, wasn't an issue with the flesh. It tasted good. Cool. Yeah, okay. Louis, if you, if, you, if you were shore diving, you're a, new, you're a beginner, you're on the shore and you're trying to get your first dewey or your first Mulloway, what are you looking for from the shore? Like, wh- where do you start? Yep. So, okay, the first the first thing is to, to go where no one else has gone. So, you know, if if you're in, um, you know, think about where you're going to go. Generally, in populated areas, they're going to be really hard to find. So, around, you know, around towns and stuff. So, look for nice secluded headlands, rocky outcrops. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a big headland. It could be just a tiny little bunch of rocks near, near a beach or just out from a beach and, um, yeah, just as long as there's waves breaking and, um, you know, giving a good wash coverage around that area, just have a swim through there. River mouths are good, um, you, you know, around the edges. Headlands around river mouths are really good. So, yeah, there's a few okay. little pointers. All right. So we know what to look for, swashy areas, headlands, little holes, that kind of thing. Um, now, it's pretty sort of unique sort of challenging diving in that swash zone. What sort of gear is tailored best to this kind of spearfishing? Uh, look, yeah, you definitely don't want to have a big float line and a float that's going to get you, you know, stuck around rocks and just cause a nightmare. So um, I'm going to say for safety's sake, take a float with a drop weight on it and anchor your, your float out the back. Yeah. And then um, so when you go right in the wash zone, I mean, I don't, I don't really think you need a reel or anything because – you know, you're in that shallow water. You can generally control a, a mulloway. You know, even even a 20 kilo mulloway. You know, that big one I shot. I didn't have float or a reel or anything. I just had a spear gun. So, nice. um, yeah, I don't. I mean, that's not to say that you. There's not a situation where you will need it, but most of the time, because it's shallow, that they're, they're just going to kind of run, and you they might pull you along a bit, but you just yeah keep control of it. And yeah, I, I remember the well, I swam into a dewy hole one day and. I um, it was quite a big swell, and I had a, had an open muzzle gun, and I dove down. And as I dove down, a wave kind of hit me, and I kind of gathered myself and got to the bottom and looked up, and I had, you know, twenty kilo jewfish all around me, and my open muzzle gun, the, the string had come off, and the spear was uh. just flopping around everywhere, and I was like, oh no. So yeah, I'd say I'd steer away from open muzzle guns unless you've got a, a you know, a really good one that you trust and you want to use, but. Okay. I like the closed muzzle guns just for that. For yeah, it makes sense. And what about sort of the length the length of your gun? I'm, I'm guessing a shorter gun? Yep. Yeah, I'd definitely go with shorter is better. Probably, you know, a 90 centimetre gun would be ideal, something quite short or, yeah, it depends what you've got, I guess. I don't I don't have a huge quiver of spear guns, so I just have, you know, one or two guns, that I, a short gun and a long gun that I use for everything. So, so 90, 90 centimetres, um, uh, a, a short float line um, with a drop weight, um, any fins will do the job? Yeah, I mean, because you're going to get bashed around, you'd probably go not use carbons and, uh, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> try yeah. and save, you, save your fins a bit. But, um, no, look, yeah, any fins will do the job. But, uh, yeah, plastic Cressy Gara style ones are always good because they can take a bit of a beating cool. and you're not going to end up cracking them. Yeah, for sure. Oh. Hey, can I pump you for one more question? Yep. A, a mulloway or jewfish, pound for pound, they're cold water species and you're probably going to find stuff like kingfish and um, those sort of like, as pelagic fish in the area, probably kingfish. How do they go pound for pound in a fight compared to your kingies? Uh, oh, look, I'd say that they tire a lot quicker yep. and they are probably no, nowhere near as strong. That would be my, mm. my experience. But, um, yeah, I mean, a kingy, a kingy's fight really hard and and try and wriggle off and get away but Mulloway seem to kind of they, they'll swim hard for a bit and they've got that big broom tail so they've got power in it but they tire very quickly cool, cool. I think uh, I think that I think that wraps yeah. Mulloway up oh, now mate I'm sorry I was <laughs> just, really good I'm um, just trying to paint a picture there for for you guys like you know like what to look for what it's like when you're in there what gear they need and yes. what to expect when you get your first big Mulloway on so I think we've pretty much covered all of that yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. The other thing you sort of touched on was marine sanctuary zones, and you, you sort of like alluded to one of the benefits is like you can go in and you can observe some species that you probably don't see as relaxed in some of the other places in the open ocean. Uh, what are some of the other things that you wanted to talk about w- around marine zones, Louis? Uh, yeah, look, I think that there's a, a clear benefit to having sanctuary zones for for that viewing purpose. And I also, you know, have a, have a kind of suspicion that, that, you know, there's a lot of science done, some good stuff out of New Zealand and stuff where they're showing A lot of good effects. stuff out of New Zealand, just quietly. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful country. But, um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, like, you, you go to... If I dove at a spot in New Zealand called Goat Island and it's just amazing going yeah. to see those big snapper in there, like, and they're just following you around. But, they, yeah, they've, they've done studies in areas around there where, you know, they're showing that the, that the species are doing well in that area and, and spilling out and you're getting, you know, improvement in that species. So I think, yeah, I think it's really good to, to be well managed and, and ensure we fish sustainably. Yeah. I like it. We, we, we've got a um, regular place we head out to off Morton called um, Flinders Reef. And um, it's a big marine zone, and that seems to have a lot of spillover into a lot of the other areas with um, some of the species that seem to, you know, um, hang out around there. And obviously the scuba divers love it. It's a great place to observe um, fish. But, yeah, it seems to have some good positive impacts from what I've sort of heard, but I haven't seen any research, but I'm sure that it it does. So Yeah. I think the, um, you know, the the critical error that can be made is things like the, the Coral Sea Marine Park where they're, you know, closing areas that not a lot of people go to that's going to be impossible for them to manage the closure of that area and it's not really benefiting many people and except for you know you know it's not really going to discourage illegal fishermen from other countries coming in there so it's it's you know it's got to be smart and sensibly managed Mm. and you know appropriate so yeah while we're there, like you've done a lot of spearfishing, I think it sounds in quite a few states, um, and obviously Australia's fishery is sort of managed on a state by state basis. Which yep. which state or territory, in your opinion, is kind of doing it the best, and um, and and sort of what could maybe the other states adopt that they're, the one they're doing well? Yeah, ah, uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think that New South Wales for me has. They haven't. They've missed the mark in a lot of areas. Like WA has got really good overall limits on their species. You know, allowing in in New South Wales, allowing a guy to catch five Spanish mackerel and five wahoo and five cobia. You know, that's fifteen massive fish potentially could mm. be. You know, that's that's way more than any recreational fisherman needs. Yeah. So I think um, WA has got much better limits where you know it's it's um, two two demersal fish a day and. And, you know, I can't remember, but you're limited to your pelagic fish. So, yeah, I think having having overall limits like, you know, on pelagic and demersal species rather than individual species limits is is a much better way to go. Like, And, um, yeah, I mean, we, over here, the dewfish, the, like the, the West Australian dewfish mm. is, um, is, is obviously they've recognised that they've massively overfished it and... So they brought in these really tight rules around it, and it's really uh, inspiring to see how many of the little juvenile dewfish you're seeing nowadays. Oh, cool! So you're getting, you know, on reefs where you wouldn't have seen them five years ago, you're getting even around Perth and areas like this where it's just really heavily fished. You're seeing these little juvenile dewies, like you know, 40, 40, 50 centimeter ones. So it's yeah, it's really good. Cool. Today's Veterans Vault was brought to you in partnership with Penetrator Fins. Making the switch from plastic freediving fins to a carbon or composite freediving blade makes a huge difference. You you don't feel like you're finning through mud anymore. Fatigue and soreness in the ankles goes away. Penetrator blades are lighter and more reactive, and they've improved my diving, and I'm sure they're going to improve yours. Check out the custom Noob Spiro Octopus Edition at noobspiro.com. Or for the full range of penetrator fins, head over to penetratorfins.com. All right, let's change pace a bit. Um, yep. What's the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing? Uh, I had to think about this one, and it was a bit of a tricky one, but I, I have a very funny experience out on the water, but I was actually kayak fishing, so I'll, I'll count that close enough. Yeah. But <laughs> I, um, I took a buddy out from work the other day, and we were just squidding in the bay out of Coban Sound here, and this boat with these two fishermen kind of just pulled up next to us, and the guys you know, kind of started casting their lures in. And I double took and I was going, is something, are those guys wearing any clothes? And the guy's like, no, nah, I don't think so. The, the dude gets up on the, top of his, on the top of his canopy and he's casting out with his, you know, he's 
got it all on show. <laughs> With his rod. <laughs> and, we're, and he pulls right up to us and goes, how you going, boys? You caught anything? <laughs> like, uh... <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was pretty, uh, pretty unusual. These two blokes had just decided to go fishing nude. Yeah, well, whatever floats your boat, eh? <laughs> Good on them. Yeah, it was quite entertaining. <laughs> that sounds entertaining. Uh, it sounds like Turbo's idea of a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're going, buddy. <laughs> all right, so, all right, mate. Moving on from um, your nudie nude fisherman, um, yep. mate. Tell us a bit about what's in your dive bag. Like, uh, what do you? What's your go-to guns? Your your wetsuits. What, what's the stuff you routinely use? And and you could recommend to somebody. Yep. So I, I'll give a um, quick mention that I do have. I am supported by Aimright. He's been giving us some gear, so you know, it's not uh, a totally partial judgment. But yeah. Um, yeah, they make some really good gear. So I've got uh, a couple of I've got a three mil and a five mil suit, and I'll uh, don the. I'm almost back to the three mil, but I, it's a bit of getting a bit old now. So it's I'm still wearing my five mil pants. Yeah. And so otherwise, I've got. Uh, an Aimrite King Venom 120, which is my kind of go-to gun for everything at the moment. Because yep. I, you know, diving here, I don't really hunt the shallows because it's not really, yeah, there's not. I mean, you, diving shallowish water, but there's not really kind of washy stuff around here like yep. on the east coast. Okay. So um, yeah, so I've got a pair of Spieri fins. I don't know how you say that. The Spier, South African. Spier, I think Spier. yeah, the French one. <laughs> yeah. Is it French? Is yeah. it? Yeah, I think so. Are they are they carbon? Ah, uh, they're fiberglass ones. But okay. I think the guy, I think he's in South Africa. The good, but he might be French. I don't know. Oh, I just chucked uh, it out there. I thought it'd sound yeah, yeah. knowledgeable. <laughs> 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 After he's called you Lewis lot like, three times in a row. Oh, anyway. oh no! <laughs> uh, no, I didn't even notice. So <laughs> sweet, I got away with it. Um. So yeah, it's um. They're probably the best set of blades I've had in a long time because they, you know, I wore them while I was ab diving for. You know, nine months and they yeah held up really well. So I've been happy with them. Um, I've got a pair of penetrators as well that I need to start using more. Yep, but yep. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of waiting for my old ones to cark it, but they're holding out. So nice. Um, and then I've got I've just I've got a rife float. Um, Atmosphere. And yeah, uh, it's not. It's one of the. Not the two atmosphere. It's just like the regular one. I don't know. It's okay. a bit cheaper and that does the trick. It's not like super high pressure or anything. It's just yep. yeah, yeah. Um, what float line are you partnering with that? I just use. I like um, ski rope. I've always used yeah. ski rope since I was a kid. I don't know something about it that just it floats well. I don't know. Yep. I like that when you, you know, when you're coming out of caves and stuff, it doesn't seem to get as well t- as tangled. Yep. And um, and and you do a bit of deeper diving. What sort of Length float line are you using and sort of how do you work it? Uh, I've got a 30-metre float line. Um, I, to be honest, I haven't done a lot of deep diving over over on the West Coast. Yep. Um, just because you generally can get most of the fish you need in 10 to 15 metres. Um, oh, oh, send me an invite. We're in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, yeah it's, compared to the East Coast, it's very different diving over here. You know, it's just really about finding fish here, whereas East Coast – Often you know the fish are there in twenty meters plus, but it's just hard work, really hard mm. work. So, okay. yeah, but it's it's um, you know comparing Perth and Sydney over over here, you've got that many more different demersal species that are all five class eating fish. So it's yeah. it's very nice. Mate, while, while we're still in your dive bag, yep. I, I got a, I got a question I want to put to you. Big problem are gloves and socks. Like they seem to blow out constantly. Have you found, or what can you recommend as your longest lasting set of gloves and socks? Uh, yeah, oh, it's it's not a solvable problem. I think it's just yeah. a fact <laughs> they're just of life. disposables, aren't they? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a shame. It'd be great if someone could make something that will last forever. But I mean, I had I had a pair of the Rife um, coated booties, and I thought that they were going to be my lifelong booties, but one of the toes burst out of that, so that was a bit of a dud. But um, I, I, I still just use the Cressy ones just because they're comfortable and uh, Cheap. I think ev- everyone uses them. They're just, yeah. Yeah. They're like they two, two mil? Two mil size? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Two yeah. mil or three. Uh, yeah. Two mil ones. Yeah. Um, they, they might even be 2.5. Yeah. They're good socks. I use the same ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, and gloves. I <laughs> I remember as a kid just using my mum's gardening gloves all the time and that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. She'd, she'd get pretty angry when she'd go looking for them. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, otherwise, 
there's not really that many that will last. I mean, the Cressy ones will break pretty quickly, yep. even yep. though they're comfortable and warm. Um, just depends, what, yeah, what you're doing. If you know you're going to be going and chasing craze and stuff, then then definitely you'd go with a um, you know just a cheap Bunning style um, coated rubber cloated glove. You know those ones. Yeah, I know the ones, the yellow and blue kind of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah I think you get in different colours, yeah. but yeah. When you were doing your ab diving, what gloves were you using, and what what sort of equipment sort of has transferred yeah. over nicely from that into regular spearfishing? I mean, we were just using the cheap gloves you get from Bunnings like um you know you just go through them so quickly yeah that, yeah and and often you know there'd be like you know there'd just be gloves hanging out everywhere you just pick up any any glove you can that's still got a finger left in it it's just, <laughs> <laughs> they're just yeah. so disposable but um yeah otherwise uh no look i think i had most of the kit that i used before i still use so yeah i mean i had it i had a seven mil weddy wetsuit which was like awesome for for the um, cold, cold water. So was that in, in Tassie? No, nah, no, nah, it was in southwestern Australia, so it was between um, Esperance and Augusta. Okay. So it's a pretty be- beautiful place to do it because it's, you know, always 15 to 20 metre viz and some amazing sea life and fish down there. It's really cool. And are, are those jobs kind of readily available and what's the money like? Uh, uh, the, no, the money's not great, but okay. it's pretty good. But if you were a... Um, if you're a commercial diver, you could probably do better elsewhere. But it's just it's just such an awesome experience, and I, and it's not readily available. There's only eight boats that do it between that zone, and you know most of them have got divers already. So it's I guess you I was kind of lucky to know someone from when I worked at the spearfishing magazine, a guy that used to write articles for us. I um, got in touch with him, and so yeah, it's kind of lucky for me. So ah oh, nice. Yeah. Any other transfers just while we're there from 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 diving for abs back to spearfishing? Like what? Like nine months working intensively in the water must have been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's awesome to wake up every morning and go diving. That's like every every spearo's dream, I think. But yeah, um, yeah. It's it's very challenging hu- hunting for abs in that that zone because it's not the most prolific abalone area. So you end up. On some dives, you know, you've swum for a couple of k's or something, and you haven't found anything. And it's re- it's quite a funny mindset when you're underwater that you, you know, until you've found or seen your first one, you're like, oh, I'm useless at this. I can't find. It. I can't find any. It's like <laughs> like the nitrogen gets to your brain or something, and yeah. then and then you finally find one. You're like, oh yeah, I'm alright. I'm alright. I'm alright. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd hate to see you when you you and you've got twenty in your bag then. <laughs> <laughs> Today's show is proudly brought to you in partnership with Adreno. You can find them at spearfishing.com.au. Today in Lewis's dive bag, we talked about aim right, wetsuits and spear guns. You can find a comprehensive range of their gear at spearfishing.com.au. Use the code NoobSpearo to save $20 on all purchases over $200. Shop with our sponsors, spearfishing.com.au and support our show. But next section of the show is called Fast Five Facts for Noobs. So if you were starting out spearfishing all over again, what five pieces of advice would have helped you out the most? Yeah, so I guess the, the first one would be to chill out and take things a bit slower. Um, you know, it's always eager to rush, but if you can slow down your movements in the water and things like that, you'll end up being a lot more efficient and you won't get as tired and you'll find more fish. Cool. So just chilling out. Uh, this is The second one is to listen more. So... You know, taking that advice on that people are giving you, older divers, just, you know, keep your ears peeled. Less is more when it comes to weights is my third one. So making sure that you're weighted properly and if anything, slightly lighter than slightly heavier because when you're slightly heavier, you're going to use heaps more energy getting off the bottom. And even though it might feel nice when you're drifting down, by the end of the day, you'll be really tired. So that's my third one. Number four is the preparation, making sure that you don't forget anything because that was my biggest, fault, uh, my biggest fault when I was a kid. So I, I came up with the seven S's to help me to remember all my gear before I went diving. So that's sink, see, swim, shoot, stab, stay warm and survive. Cool. So to sink is your weight belt. To see is your mask and snorkel. To swim is your fins. To shoot is your spear gun. To stab is your knife. To stay warm is your wetsuit, and to survive is your float and your float line. 
Sure. And my fifth tip is to get all the info you can out of Noob Spiro because the guys are legends. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Well, How's that for a plug? I <laughs> oh, love it. That's great. <laughs> Sign on to our email newsletter, maybe. You want to put that in there? <laughs> we <laughs> won't send you crap. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, good. Um, okay, so just quickly, number one was chill out, relax, and slow down. Yep. Number two was listen more. So get around some more experienced people and just listen to what they have to say um, and, and use your ears kind of thing. Yep. Number three, use less weight, less is more. Number four was get <laughs> oh, seven S is preparation. So sink, see, swim, shoot, stab, stay warm, and survive. I'll link up the other things you mentioned in those each item in the show notes. Number five, join the Noob Spiro newsletter. I think. Rail right that one. Did, did you I say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you wanted to say yeah. it like inside. So yeah. maybe a bit of intuition there. So, but that's yep. good. So look, let's circle up. You had a story to talk about with listening, I believe. Yeah, um, so yeah, quite a funny one. When I was a kid, I was well, I was probably I must have been eighteen because I was in the pub. <laughs> um, and there's sure a, there's you were, a, buddy. <laughs> there's a, there was an old chap in there that was probably he, he looked like he was about one hundred and twenty, but he was probably about eighty. <laughs> and he, um, you know, he was a local there, and and he had rotted out teeth. All his teeth were rotted out, and and he looked a bit like Pavarotti, so we used to call him Pavarotti teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so he he was a Spiro. He was a Spiro from like the fifties and sixties. He wow. te- he tell really good stories, and he yeah he told us told us his story one day about um, this spot which we used to always dive. It was we used to call it Spot X because it was our secret spot. Yep. But apparently, Pavarot teeth have been slain it for years. <laughs> uh, and so. He was telling a story about how he swam down the bottom there and it's about 17 metres, so back in the day it was pretty solid. And he reckons there was a school of like, he reckons there was 100 Jewfish sitting on the bottom there and he shot a a 25 kilo one and and took it home. And it was just interesting because, you know, that's a spot that we just dove religiously and we've never seen a single Jewy there. So it's interesting to see how times change and, you know, it's yeah worth listening to elders and just getting that experience so that we can have the knowledge to pass on and that's a big part of why I think it's important to document what we do and and share the stories and share Mm. the knowledge so that future generations can look back and go you know know, this is how it's changed and this is how you do it it's 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 a big part of like the the evolving of spearfishing Mm. keep keep the stories going yeah I like that we've um we, we're sort of followers and contributors to IFSN and SDM, two of the local magazines here in Australia. But, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's great what you say. We've got a blog going as well, probably not quite as extensive as the drystore.com.au. You've got some great articles on there, Louis. Yeah, cheers, mate. Um, so we'll link that up in the show notes. So I was just wondering if you had a call to action for our audience, like a, maybe a specific action you'd, you'd like them to, to take um, after the show. Yeah, so yeah, check out check out drystore.com.au and see what's um yeah. See, yeah, there's some interesting stuff up there that we've been putting up. So I did a week long trip uh, up to Northwest Island about oh, it'd, be, it'd be two and a half years ago now, but um, one of the guys had one of your bags up there, and um, every day we sort of we had the boat parked outside the Coral Cay and we took a tender out there, and you yep. know depending on the tide it was. You know, all sorts of stuff could happen on the way up. But um, one of them had that one of your bags, and so we had to put all our cameras and um, iPhones and stuff in there. It was it was super handy. Uh, I've been yeah. meaning to get one for a while. It's just something that you sort of don't plan to do. But um, yep. I, I think we're better now that you've come on the show. I feel, <laughs> I feel sort of guilty. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 to be honest, like I'm a huge user of my of my dry bags, and I I've used them as floats and stuff, and you know putting. When I'm going for abs and stuff just down the coast here, I just and fish I, in sharky areas, I just put all my fish in it, and and then I know that there's no blood or anything coming out, so I don't have to feel sketchy. Like in South Australia, when I'm diving down there, I don't want to have fish towing around behind me, so I just use it as a float. So I shouldn't oh, really, yeah. because it's not what it's made for. But <laughs> that's a great idea, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and yeah, and for for wet weddies, like when you when you've been diving and you come home, you, you want to chuck your wet weddie in the car, just stick it in a dry bag. It's pretty useful. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. I right. bet not. Get, I bet not get too intense on the plug. <laughs> nah, nah. It's all good, man. Like it's a, it's a good fit with our audience. Like obviously, some guys probably have a need for it, so it's all right. Yep. Uh, all good. But that's about it. So um, yeah, thanks for joining us on the show today. People can come and check you out at drystore.com.au. Thanks for joining us, Louis. No worries. Cheers, guys. 
Thanks for listening today, guys. I hope you got a lot out of Louie's interview. I sure did. Learning everything about Mulloway was awesome. Next week, we feature a Spiro from Galveston, Texas. His name is Ben Choi. We talk about diving man-made structure, the sort of the do's and don'ts around diving oil rigs, shipwrecks, how to deal with current and float lines and things like that in these big structures and what the fish life is like and over there. And it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool interview, so enjoy. Thanks for listening to today's show. Make sure to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To learn more about becoming a better Spiro, visit us at noobspiro.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Turbo, why would listeners want to subscribe to the Noob Spiro newsletter? Well, Shrek, if they subscribe to our newsletter, we will send them the Noob Spiro guide to getting started, which includes the dive day equipment checklist. Not only that, you get the top 10 tips for becoming a better Spiro from the world's best and more. Can you give us an example of one of those tips? Get a mentor. That's one that pops up a lot. Ah, nice. Like I was to you. (laughs) I'm in.